Hello. Uh, I hope uh, some of you are uh, already there. And uh, we decided that today we will have a short uh, session live with some of the questions which were uh, taken up by some students. Uh, so I tried uh, to make a small little presentation to you, uh, which can help. And in the meantime, uh, if more questions come, we'll take them up. And uh, our time uh, is about an hour or so. So let me see uh, what I have uh, planned for you. So uh, in this live uh, session, what we are going to be looking at the, the agenda part of it as to uh, what we're going to do. So first, uh, welcome to the session. Yes, uh, it's the first session. So hopefully uh, some of the queries that have been raised in between uh, would uh, have been uh, either answered, but I'll take up some of them in different ways. And some questions, if they are coming live, we'll pick them up. And in between, whenever some question comes, I'll, I'll see what the question is, and then uh, I'll be able to uh, give some answer to that. I hope you are able to see this presentation uh, slides. So uh, there is one interesting thing which uh, some people had asked about uh, stretch and bulk. So let me uh, see if we can uh, define this correctly. And that is, So if you see a situation where we had a bundle of flat filament yarn, obviously it is very difficult to stretch this and it has a limited amount of bulk. But if we do the texturing, each filament, as you have probably learned by now, takes up shapes of different types and has certain amount of additional volume which it takes. And therefore, suddenly what you see is a large amount of space or a volume gets occupied. And that increases in some sense what we call as a bulk. We define this also as a specific volume per unit mass, all right? This is what we talked about. So that should not be a problem to understand as to why the volume has increased because each of the filament now is no more flat. It has taken a certain shape. But at the same time, if we extend this in the other direction, then they can be stretched. And that is what defines the stretch. How much is the crimp or now, you know, the helical structures that we may have uh, built in after this process, that is what will define as to how much the stretch will be. Let us say So we uh, have already seen it, but let me just draw it again for you. So this is the strain. So this is what defines our most of the properties. Then the stress and invariably a textured yarn or a stretch yarn would show a curve like this. What it means is that this part is the part where there is a decrimping taking place, okay, decrimping. So there must have been uh, various kinds of, you know, you can say, well, the helices or crimp, crinkles or whatever, they would open up and at a very low stress value, it's a low stress. So all the extension that takes place at a very low stress will 
actually be in the category of stretch. Beyond this point, the filament is not decrimping, but it is actually extending at a molecular level where we consider this as a large deformation. It's a large deformation compared to this portion, which we call as a small deformation. So anything which is in the small deformation will be called a stretch and uh, which is in the larger deformation that will be called an extension, extension of the yarn, uh, which normally you measure on a tensile tester and uh, you, you can get the stress and strain, stress and curve, okay. But in a tensile tester, if you're looking at extension at break, then invariably we may first do pre-tensioning and therefore this small deformation area, which is a decrimping area has been taken care of by small load. And then after that, we would be probably looking at this as a major uh, portion for the extension. There was another question which uh, was uh, raised at some point about the turbo duo, which is a very interesting process by itself. So the process which is uh, interesting in the sense that you have a pre-twisted yarn. And if you somehow ensure that the two yarns are continuously being fed into this zone, which is a pre-twisted zone, and therefore untwisted yarns will keep on coming to the pre-twisted zone and then get twisted and then they are separated. So uh, tension is here, T1, T2, let's say, and another tension we have T3, T4. So this was a question or doubt related to tensions. So invariably, if T1 and T2 are equal, then the position of this pre-twisted zone will stay as it is, all right? Are you getting the point? And so in the pre-twisted uh, zone, the yarn remains in a twisted condition. So the tensions in both the yarns which are being fed should be kept the same. If they are not the same, then this position of the pre-twisted zone will keep shifting to one side or the other. There is no doubt that the tension which will be uh, in the output zone, the T3, T4, should also be the same, okay? They should also be the same. If they are different, then you would also have a problem of uh, the pre-twisted zone shifting to one position or the other position, all right? That's what is meant to be. Then there is another question which was related to setting and testing. So we have the method which we had said called the HETRA method. The, the HETRA method is the one which was originally designed and this basically was a method where you were testing the textured filaments in a bath which had water. 
And the reason was that you wanted to remove the temporary set. So nylon as such obviously gets a very interesting uh, situation where in water, the trans glass transition temperature of nylon becomes less than room temperature. And because it becomes less than room temperature, the temporary set gets removed. In the case of polyester, on the other hand, because for the case of polyester, we have uh, the glass tension temperature pretty high higher than room temperature, polyester does not get affected by the uh, water because the hydrophobic material. Therefore, this test was modified and therefore you could either do in a hot water relaxation where the temperature set could go before you start measuring the L1, L2 or you could put it in a any hot oven. The temperature of the oven and the hot water is not very high. It is very near the glass transition temperature so that the temporary set is removed. And this would not obviously harm or modify the final properties uh, which you measure as a cream rigidity because there the setting was done at quite high temperatures, much, much higher than the glass transition temperature. So we do not expect any of the such changes to take place. Then there was also a question, can we have S twist and Z twist on the same twister? Of course you can have if you change the belt directions, but simultaneously at the same time either it will be, it can't be both. It could be either S or Z, but in a machine, you can have different twisting units, different texturing positions, actually twisting at uh, different uh, 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 either Z or S. So those, those type of things are possible. Why should you have twist either in S or Z direction? Why should you have, why doesn't it just one? Of course, you can, have all the yarns uh, which are only in S or only in Z, which will be twisted. But when you make a fabric, particular knitted fabric, you may find that if all the yarns are S twisted or Z twisted, then the fabric may have a rolling tendency. So in practice, it is possible that you may have one yarn S, the next yarn Z, and the next yarn S or any such combination that you may like to add in a fabric so that the rolling tendency uh, is balanced and so you have a balanced fabric. So this is how it could be interesting but the same twister can twist either in S or Z direction depending upon what kind of a uh, belt arrangement that you do. So some of the questions are related to stuffer box uh, texturing with as a basic uh, simple principle which means you just have some arrangement where the yarn is being fed and then it just bends and then taken out. Of course, based on the overfeed that you have. In between, when this is actually in this configuration, we are supposed to heat the yarn. The yarn can be heated in many ways. One of the ways is that you inject steam in the box. 
if you inject steam in the box then obviously steam being a fluid can obviously contact each and every part of various filaments and therefore a relatively more uniform uh, heating treatment can be given of course you can heat the walls of the stuffer box well that would only mean that those which are very near the wall or touching the wall will get heated there is also a possibility that you can actually have a, the feed roller as the heated roller which would mean that the yarn gets heated as it is being thrown into that way one can control uh, the crimp and crimp length and so on and so forth uh, let me see if any other question has come uh, if there is a question as of now uh, we, we have uh, i hope uh, some of you are live and listening if the question comes then i'll take that question also so before that let me go further there was some uh, discussion on uh, the orientation and amorphous uh, regions also you see in any polymer there are two major components are there one is the crystalline part which obviously gives it dimensional stability and an amorphous part of a thing which gives it flexibility extensibility and in some cases obviously absorption and diffusion of solvents and dyes and so on and so forth so these are two different parts while orientation is or a disorientation could be in all kind of regions you know like one is a molecular orientation where let's say if you can handle every molecule then you can have all the molecules aligned to the x of the fiber very nice it can happen but it may not happen but molecular orientation then you have two regions which are the crystalline region and the amorphous region so crystalline regions also within the crystal there is a good amount of orientation but within the crystal very good amount of order is there but the crystal could be lying in any direction and therefore when you stretch the one crystalline zones also get oriented towards the direction of the stress so orientation is trying to pull the things whether the crystalline entity is there or an amorphous entity is there all of them can be oriented so this is how one must discuss these terms like orientation and amorphous region the glass transition temperature can be roughly defined by this type of a curve also where if you plot temperature in any kind of a polymer and rate of crystallization so you get a curve of this type so at a very high temperature where formation of crystal is almost negligible beyond this is melting so all the molecules are free to move in in their own formats and so getting an order done will be very difficult the glass transition temperature is on this side where the temperature is quite low and the molecules are relatively more rigidly there but crystalline order may not be defined so a temperature beyond which what we call as a segmental mobility is reduced quite a lot and so crystallization also does not take place but like we said in the case of nylon the glass transition temperature can be shifted to lower temperatures if if moisture and uh, a water or such kind of things or any other solvent uh, interacts with this polymer so this can be changed on the other hand if you do uh, any kind of a cross linking 
then this would be a difficult situation. But that is what the glass transition temperature, where the segmental mobility gets restricted. Therefore, the term glass has come in. So, crystallinity development in high speed spinning. High speed spinning is a term which is used where the spinning speed spinning speed are greater than let's say 1000 meter per minute can go up to 6000 meter per minute and if one increases the spinning speed a term which we call as a residual draw ratio it decreases because during spinning itself orientation of the polymer chain is taking place right so around this time which we call as a fully drawn yarn almost fully drawn yarn but drawn not in the normal way like you do spinning and then drawing that is what is not being done but the spinning speed during the melt spinning or for example, is increased and therefore the orientation happens and residual draw keeps on going down when the when it comes to a situation when you cannot draw further, that's the fully drawn yarn and so you can get that. But during this process, while at a very low spinning speed, the crystallinity for example may be very low, but it may also increase as you increase the spinning speed because of stress induced crystallization process and so the crystallinity will be developed in that manner in in some of the cases where we look at a draw texturing we call it a partially oriented yarn so you have not gone for the full speed maybe around 3000 to 3500 approximately uh, meters per minute will give you p o y all right so this is how you you get an textured material which will be an interesting material there was uh, one question related to if the twist is different from the twister for example what do we have there is a take up roller then there is a heating and then you have the feed roller so here you have the heater and you have a twister here so twist is here untwist is in this direction untwist and twist now the value of the twist just near the twister is obviously the maximum. If you were happy, you were having a situation where the yarn does not come into contact with anything, then this value could be quite similar from the feed roller to the twisting point. But in practice, you have guides which are changing directions you have heater on which the yarn is actually in contact therefore rotation can be affected because of frictional reasons and then another gu guide is there and then you have the feed roller so while the twist will flow from twister to the feed roller the amount of twist per meter in the yarn may not be same it will keep on decreasing so the question comes 
that means the yarn is going to be non uniformly treated twisted uh, not necessarily because the same yarn which at the point of the feed roller has a little less twist but as it is moving up the the twist obviously is increasing again so every part of the yarn will go through the same process initially less twist then more twist and then more twist in the heater and after that getting cool so when it gets cool then you have to untwist so this is an important part that you must be able to cool the yarn before untwisting takes place if a hot yarn is untwisted all the setting that we are interested in uh, would would not be seen then what should be the temperature of texturing so we if you look at the same curve again where you have temperature and rate of crystallization plot where this is close to tg and this is close to tm and you have a point where this is k max so what should be the temperature are we talking about heater temperature or are we talking about the yarn temperature if you're talking about the yarn temperature obviously we love the temperature to be here because the rate of crystallization would be high and so you would require less time for doing the same thing but as we already know that the yarn is at room temperature as it is moving along the heater this is the temperature is going to rise and it's quite possible that the temperature by the time the yarn actually attains the heater temperature it may be almost exiting the heater so we we are not sure because we are not measuring the yarn temperature if you are measuring the yarn temperature then we could be talking about the k max but the heater temperature is what we actually do the optimization with and so generally the heater temperature may be slightly higher than the uh, temperature at which we get the rate maximum so maybe a few degrees 5 10 degrees higher so that definitely you are going to be achieving a better rate of crystallization that is how it will work any questions uh, we have received it appears still there are no questions then there was a question related to bare so bare has been defined as either a rogue bare or a block bare a rogue bare means that the yarn has been really mistreated and therefore the dye absorption absorption is very high in such yarns and if these type of yarns come and are used in a woven fabric along with other yarn which is not rogue in that sense then it will be very easily visible because the dye uptake here is going to be more than four to five times higher than the the normal yarn and so it will be quite uh, distinctly visible there is no way such type of yarns have to be avoided and how do you avoid first obviously take care of the machine parameters and if something has gone wrong and you actually are able to identify so some identification processes have to be obtained these yarns must be segregated and taken away they cannot be used along with it and there's no way anybody can correct them also 
a block bare on the other hand would mean that some change has taken place in thy reception but to the order of 2 to 5 percent only so if you have two yarns together with such type of thing where 2 to 5 percent difference in thy uptake is there you would not be able to distinguish from naked eye at all however if some of these yarns which are let's say uh, 2% less are uh, come together then the rest of them then becomes a block and they become visible however the block bare can be corrected at the uh, fabric preparation stage or by changing the position of the packages in a knitting machine for that matter the juxta positioning can actually break the blocks and so you may not be able to see the bare so that also uh, why the difference comes is because of the structural property changes that take place uh, during this heat setting which is also the texturing process thermomechanical differences so it is the difference in the dyeing characteristics which is there and obviously it is because some change may have occurred in the let's say crystalline amorphous resin content and and the size of crystals and so on and so forth somebody had raised this question whether the history of the parent yarn i mean generally there's a kind of question would affect uh, bare if you remember the reason why somebody suggested that there should be a draw texturing process was only because of this because if different histories are created during spinning different histories are created during drawing stage and then you take it to texturing so a highly crystalline yarn a relatively highly crystalline yarn would behave slightly differently response wise and so the final yarn also would be different and if they are different then the bare uh, expectation is there and that's why people thought that if you have larger packages the drawing and texturing could be combined together so you are reducing the variation in the history of the parent yarn then this question was uh, related to migration of filaments migration of filaments why does the migration takes place in during twisting it is because of the difference in tension of the filaments which are on the surface and the filaments which are in the core of the yarn in a fully drawn yarn for that matter all the filaments let's assume have same stress strain characteristics but when you twist some of the filaments which are on the surface obviously have to are going to be in more stress because they have to traverse a larger path and because of that they become under tension but because all the filaments have similar characteristics the ones which are at a high tension have a tendency to go inside because the inner inner filaments have less tension and so the shifting takes place that is why the migration takes place while in the case of let's say undrawn yarn if you do the twisting migration does not take place or takes place much lesser or poor this is because the outer filaments which are under more stress instead of creating pressure to move in they extend by themselves when they extend by themselves the tension obviously is released and so difference in tension is also less between the filament which are in and filament which are out and so migration becomes poor there was a question which somebody had put in whether the if you have variation in the heating 
or variation in the cooling, the broken filaments will increase or not. The variations of heating and cooling would definitely have an impact on crimp rigidity. Heating obviously will have much more impact compared to cooling. But if the cooling time is reduced too much, then obviously it will also have impact on the uh, development of crimp rigidity, which means setting process is not good or is being disturbed before uh, the whole untwisting takes place. Even if the heating and cooling are same, the broken filaments can happen in draw texturing, particularly of a draw texturing when you have friction texturing also. When you change the D by Y ratio, we increase the disc to the yarn ratio, then what would happen is a large amount of twist will be inserted, but at the same time, untwisting also will increase. What is to be point to be remembered is that there is a tension T1 input and there is a tension T2 output tension. It is the output tension which is more responsible for broken filament. You may keep the temperature same exactly, keep the cooling same, but based on the tensions that you have at the output uh, part of the machine, they will be more responsible for a broken filament. And this is more critical in the friction texturing. So there was a question somebody had put in. Uh, in the case of uh, draw texturing, I understand. How much overfeed do you get? Now, if it's a draw texturing, you are going to be drawing. So we cannot uh, give any overfeed, otherwise, how will you be drawing? So it is generally going to be under underfeed, shall we say? Because you have to draw and that depends on what is the residual draw in the in the parent yarn if it is more then you give more underfeed if it is less then you give less underfeed so another thing is that how to optimize this draw ratio during the texturing process Well, one reason could be the customer defined that my final textured yarn should have a certain amount of extension break. And so you accordingly draw and you can control the extension, extension break because there is a customer requirement. But then you are going to be changing draw ratio. The T1 and T2 ratio, okay, is the one which is actually an important uh, parameter which will have to be balanced. And this is done at any draw ratio. You may like to vary D by Y ratio or draw ratio in order that the tension levels are uh, quite close. And in this respect at any draw ratio the d by y ratio will have to be adjusted to get to the ballpark figure as to how much residual draw is needed you would be needing again the same stress strain curve So if you have a POI, it will behave like this. So you will say, well, this much I must draw 
so that at the later stage this becomes my extension at break. So uh, let me see if there is any question. Uh, we still do not have uh, any uh, live question coming. So before uh, we wind up, we are almost uh, coming to the end of uh, this uh, session. The heating of the textured yarn in a primary heater. You remember our heaters are convex shaped and why these heaters are convex shaped we believe that if they are in touch with the heater surface the yarn is in touch with the heater surface conduction mode of heat transfer would be possible Some findings later establish that conduction may not be the mode of heat transfer. Because in a textured yarn situation, the yarn is not just moving over the heater plate, but it is rotating and rotating at a very, very high speed. Okay, it's rotating at a very high speed. That would mean that around this yarn, there is almost a layer of air which is swirling along with it. And so what it that would mean is that the yarn is maybe part of the yarn are coming obviously in contact with the heater, but the air which is also swirling along with the twisting of the yarn would also be rotating around the same point and therefore possibly first the heat, most of the yarn uh, the air is going to be heated and then that heated air is going to be heating the yarn so what people have found is although our intention was that the heating should take place by conduction but in fact, after all those calculations, which did not support this conduction mechanism, so a good amount of heating takes place through convection. It may be interesting to note that while we wanted it to be conduction, but actually it's more of a convection. If you have some conduction and more of convection and then if you whatever ratios that you can think of then maybe we will be able to see how the heat gets transferred if it motivated people to uh, learn a little more about it and if convection becomes let's say the mode of heating why not it can be so one can say maybe radiation also could be a mode of heating. So a, a term called high temperature heating for texturing was also introduced. What does it mean? In the primary heater we're talking about. That means the temperatures are much higher much higher than even the melting temperatures of the filament. Then it's called high temperature. Otherwise, whatever temperatures of heating we are doing is optimum temperature, which is near the temperature where rate of crystallization is high. <clears throat> Initially, <clears throat> it is difficult to assume that you can use temperatures which are so high, which are much above the melting points. If that kind of heating is done, then those will be called high temperature heating systems. 
can such systems be contact type? You would definitely avoid contact at temperature. Let's say you want to work at a temperature of 500 degrees centigrade. You would obviously not like polymeric material to come in contact. So they may be, or they would surely be non-contact heating systems. If that happens, most of the mode of the heat transfer could be convection because it is not conduction definitely, but it could be radiation as well. Because temperature at 600 degrees, uh, the transfer before even the air gets heated through the radiation also, the heat could be transferred because the temperature difference is very high. But then why doesn't melt? It would not melt because you can move the yarn at a very high speed. That means you can really increase the speed of friction or reverse that you can make the primary heaters or heating systems very small in length. Think of the texturing heater primary of 5 centimeter, 10 centimeter. So your space requirements would be very small. So one can always think of using such type things. Although still commercially, we are still using the same convex contact type primary heaters. People can use uh, for heating high temperature steam also. You can use high temperature air as well, but people have tried high temperature steam. Now, what is the advantage of the steam? The heat transfer on a steam takes place much quicker. Why? Because a yarn at room temperature. When it comes in contact with the steam, at the surface, the steam would condense immediately. So when it condenses, then you remember the latent heat is very high. So immediately, the moment the vapor becomes liquid, immediately all that heat is transferred. And transferred to what? Only the yarn, because condensation is taking place at the yarn surface. And so, rate of heat transfer could be very high. But one has to take precautions also. So let's say we, we are coming close to uh, today's session. Uh, let me see if there are any other questions which have come. So if you have uh, free time, think about some of these things which uh, I've just put it down. It is not for your exam. Nobody will ask questions. Uh, we can look into it. And do whatever you want to do, because most of you, obviously, uh, who are interested in this are in some way engineers. And engineers are supposed to uh, design new things, new systems. So you may like to, say, design some equipment and measuring system, which can tell you what is the temperature of the yarn in a heater, primary heater. And as you know, the yarn enters at room temperature, exits at a temperature which is the maximum. If somebody wants to know the profile of temperature as it's increasing, how would you measure, how would you do, and what kind of profile will you may see? You may like to design systems, you can do it at your free will, free time. Also, we talked about superheated steam, heating. But then superheated steam, when it comes comes in contact with the other surfaces, and particularly if the people are working, then it's not good. So how can you design a heater which would use uh, superheated steam? You may have to avoid leakages. If you avoid leakages, then how the yarn go up, down, you have to think about it. And we measure the stretch in a false twist yarn. Can you design an apparatus or a test method which will measure the bulk of the false twist actually? All right. At this stage, let me see uh, what 
we have to so uh, in this uh, session we tried to take up some of the questions raised in the last few weeks uh, and throw a little more uh, insight into it hopefully uh, it will be useful and uh, let's hope uh, we continue with the next lectures and next weeks and uh, if required we may meet again uh, before the whole course finishes i hope you're enjoying thank you